Thank all of you. Um, you're going to have a treat today. Um, for one thing, we're going to explain what you were listening to as you were walking in. That will become clear at a certain point. Uh, but before we get there, uh, we'll have to take the journey that gets us there. And in this case, the journey begins with Annie Oakley over here in, in the uh, Lauren Bonn in her wonderful Western getup. She wasn't always a Western person. In fact, 10 years ago, you were in London, right? And uh, I thought, and so we're going to start by talking with Lauren about the origins of, of how, of her interest in LA, and then beyond that, uh, well, we'll see where we go, and then how she in turn ensorcels and inveigles uh, Richard Nielsen and Tristan Duke to join us on this trip. But Lauren, let's start with you coming back from London, right, about 10 years ago mm -hmm. to Los Angeles? Mm -hmm. So why don't you take it from there? What, what, what happened? Well, 10 years ago, I found myself at the foothills of the Eastern Sierra. That's uh, the image that you'll see up there. Now, you have to imagine that once upon a time before there were roads, there used to be a series of interlocking glacial lakes that would have uh, f allowed water to flow from the peaks of the Eastern Sierra straight through to the basins that were at the base of the Rockies. So there was an interlocking network of glacial lakes that um, is our ancient birth, uh, the birth of, of the Great Basin as you know it. So the Owens Valley is actually one of hundreds of basins that define the peaks and basins of the Intermountain West. So when I moved back to Los Angeles 10 years ago, I found myself very interested in how our particular city emerged and what our city's relationship to the rest of the country was, which leads us to be uh, happily here in the wonderful city of Chicago because our stories are very interrelated. Uh, one way that they're interrelated is through the myth of the West. Uh, Chicago was at one time the West Coast of the United States. Um, and it took a great deal of ingenuity to put, push farther west than that. Um, when we did, we did so for the singularity of purpose of get, gathering silver and bringing it back to the west coast. When we brought it back to the east coast, I mean, uh, one of the things we did with it was turn it into photographic film in Rochester. George Eastman had the wonderful populist instinct to make all of us feel that to be uniquely American and progressive meant that all of our memories were equally important and we all had a right to document them. So the story of photography as a mass-produced idea of popular culture and memory um, is derived from the American mountains. Because, uh, because you need silver... Because you need silver. To, to make photography. Silver nitrate, right? Is that right? Well, yeah, silver yeah. nitrate. Right. So the uh, emergence of the city of Los Angeles uh, in the, um, as a real city as opposed to just a port really comes about when photography and film uh, get shipped back from the East Coast to the West Coast and Hollywood is born. So Hollywood came to these mountains, in particular the Alabama Hills, to film westerns. And the western became the export, which the world started to think of as being mythologically American, these great historic landscapes. And to support the um, rapid pace of development of the city of Los Angeles, the one thing we didn't have, uh, despite the great climate and the wonderful Mediterranean um, plants and animals that that, that that area supported was water. So it turned out that the same mountains that we mine silver out of to create photography, uh, we also mine water out of to create the potentiality for a city to emerge. So for example, uh, uh, it reminds me, by the way, of, of a wonderful piece that ran in the New Yorker years and years ago by Richard Reeves, where he was interviewing the guy in charge of the disaster response center in Los Angeles at the underneath Parker Center. There was a war room, mm -hmm. and he's talking to this guy, and the guy says to him, the thing you have to understand about Los Angeles is there's not supposed to be a city here. 
Every square inch of Los Angeles has been wrested from nature. And fires, quakes, floods, nature wants L.A. back. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the way in which it's really been wrested from nature is precisely, as you say, that there wasn't water for a city there. Mm -hmm. And where there was water was precisely the Owens Valley, which was at that time a, a lush... Thing. Yep. One of the things we uh, to talk about the Owens Valley, by the way, is this part, the eastern Sierra Nevada, think about this, you are going from the highest place in the continental United States to the lowest place in the continental United States, from Mount Whitney to, to Death Valley. Oh. You're doing that in like 30 miles as the crow flies. And Owens Valley is right in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. So you were saying, uh, when we were talking last night, you were saying that you arrive in Los Angeles, Los Angeles is extraordinary and so forth, but you have this kind of pull toward the, the diametrical opposite of Los Angeles, which is the Owens Valley in some yeah. sense. Well, we, what we realized was that the, the, uh, the city of Los Angeles as we know it, we're also celebrating a nice round birthday, like the Chicago Humanities Festival is turning 25. We're, we turned 100 last year as a city, if you mark the city as being underpinned by the potential to grow. Because it was 100 years uh, last November that we marked a centenary since the opening of the LA Aqueduct. So, uh, By the way, people here at the festival will realize that just a few years ago, we did the 100th anniversary of the Burdum Plan mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, as the theme of the festival. Mm -hmm. and, and so there... At the time that the Great Exposition was taking place here in Chicago, there was no Los Angeles. Think about that. Yeah. I mean, really, there was a little tiny Pueblo, but there wasn't. But, but the little twinkle in the eye of people like Teddy Roosevelt, who would have been at the, at the World Expo, certainly was. And certainly the notion of American exceptionalism was uh, born and wrought to its highest level in the Chicago World Expo. So in, in many ways, Chicago gave birth in a way to the notion of Los Angeles because it was Teddy Roosevelt that made it possible for uh, Eaton, Mayor Eaton and William Mulholland to have uh, the gall to feel that they could colonize the entire uh, 240 miles from Los Angeles to the Owens Valley. The other way around, from the Owens Valley. From the to Owens Los Valley to Los Angeles to secure that land in order to create a trade network, not just from Chicago, which was the train hub, uh, to the west, but to bring back the goods, the silver in particular, both to uh, this part of the world. Because if you flash back to the late 19th century, the same time that the Chicago World Expo opened, there was a complete collapse of the American dollar due, due to overinvestment in the railway. And there was a whole movement to look at a bimetallic currency so that our currency, which was up to that point underpinned by gold, became underpinned by silver and gold. And that was a way to reinvigorate our economy. So Chicago's story and the story of the West are very intimately uh, connected, not just because of the name West, but because the same characters were playing in it, including Mark Twain, who was here uh, in the area and then went out to become a miner and was a completely failed miner and therefore discovered that he better do something and wrote for Sa San Francisco Chronicle. Um, and so the, a lot of the characters that populate this myth of American exceptionalism are rooted in the lore as well as the historic reality of our very young culture. So one, so one thing I want to bring you back to is you arrive in Los Angeles and you had the wit to wonder where all this was coming from, but you go up to the Owens Valley. Now, the Owens Valley has been laid waste. It had been this, really, this beautiful, well, you, you've seen Chinatown, so you have a sense of what was happening. Uh, this, this gorgeous, fertile area with this lake is completely drained and is, has been laid waste and you decided to go up there. And what was it like when you went up there? Fantastically beautiful. It looked just like this. So one of the um, strange aspects of beauty is when you discover its treachery. So yeah. um, to be seduced into thinking you discovered one of the most, if not the most, beautiful places on planet Earth is also the host 
of the most toxic carcinogenic dust. Beauty, uh, beauty says Rilke, is just the beginning of a terror we can only just barely endure, and we admire it so because it calmly disdains to destroy us. Although yes. we've destroyed it. Exactly. We completely destroyed this place and turned it into an incredibly beautiful place. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you, you have this uh, beautiful drive along these mountains and you see these dust devils moving through and the incredible light that brought people like Ansel Adams to bring his silver plate photography and capture the Eastern Sierra. And then you discover that, in fact, the U.S. government is saying that we must bring this uh, dust into control because it's creating, it's so light that it gets into the cloud strata and covers the entire Pacific Ocean and goes straight to China. So it also made me uh, think... And by the way, it's, it's carcinogenic. Yeah. yeah. Basically, so, so keep in mind, you had, this, you had this lake which had taken all the, 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 the minerals from up in the mountains and brought it down, and, and, and the minerals had kind of sifted down to the bottom. Well, you tell the story. The, the, yeah, the... so, you know, it takes, it takes glacial time to ground a giant mountain into powder. And the arid lands from the Rockies to the Sierra have a glacial history of moments where lakes dry up and lakes rebound, and lakes dry up and lakes rebound. But in glacial time, a dry up might take 1,000 years, you know, 1,500 years, not 25 years. So what you get is you get a dry lake bed that's full of this chemical amalgam that has never really been analyzed on our bodies in space in the time that our species has been on the planet. So it's believed that we're living in a carcinogenic bubble. Our atmosphere, we are the guinea pigs <laughs> of a sort because we're living with unknown amounts of chemistry floating around us. And some of it's analyzable. One of it that is analyzable is arsenic. So arsenic is one of the things that becomes a very fine, pulpy, uh, talc-like powder. And it does two things which cause the US government to get upset. Um, one is a medical epidemic and we don't have a great healthcare policy and chemotherapy is very expensive. Um, so that's a real problem. And the other is it gets into the engines of fighter planes because this area also is a military industrial um, flyover zone. It looks the most like the Middle East and North Africa as we can get. So we have very expensive fighter jets from places like Edwards Air Force Base. And the dust, when it gets in the high level, becomes like tiny little knives, which gets into the Rolls-Royce engines and paralyzes them. Or become tiny little knives and get into our own lungs. Right. Yeah. And do the same thing. Yeah. Um, but I want to, again, emphasize it. When you go there, that's not what you're thinking. You're just thinking, my god, this is beautiful. Well, what brought me up there, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like all of us who love art, particularly susceptible to the um, spiritual in light and form and mountains, and this is it. I mean, this if you're going to trade in London, which is a tough thing to do for the West Coast, this is where you start to feel like the bargain is working out. You know, it's, it's um, mind-boggling how beautiful it is. So can you move from that now to begin to talk about you, you found it with your cohort of whom some are here and some are there, and uh, the Metabolic Studio, what was that? Yeah. Well, uh, the idea that uh, as artists, what we want to engage in is the metabolic cycle. So rather than thinking about objects and making of objects, we thought about the two main parts of metabolism, the catabolic and the anabolic. So if the catabolic is that which is things being broken down, the anabolic is that which brings things back up. And so we, in our work together, is about the regeneration of things from a catabolic halt, like the dry lake bed, back into some kind of rebound. So our work in the Owens Valley uh, is really connected in two specific ways. One is, in the beginning, um, there was sound and vibration that we believe creates form. So we work with sound in the metabolic studio. We have a division called the sonic division. 
and we specifically are focusing our work, you, the sound you heard when you um, walked in is the sound of silos that sit on the edge. So let's slow down here. So this is silos, like, like industrial circular silos like you see here. We have silos for corn and so forth around here, but there it was for minerals that they were extracting for the lake bed. Mm -hmm. Silica and trona that were shipped back to Pittsburgh to make glass. So this was a company called Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Plate, Plate Glass. Plate. And it's an abandoned factory, mm -hmm. which you and your devilishness took over. I didn't take over it, not at all. Um, I um, found myself in it like I did the mountains and the lady who owned it uh, who is a golf pro named Tawny Tatum, who inherited it from a heart surgeon from Los Angeles who went there to create wild heart pumps that kept babies alive during open heart surgery and threw wild Los Angeles parties in there. So sh she inherited this place and then found me in there thinking I was looking for either a golf class or a party, um, I said, I'm looking for neither. I'm just, you know, captivated by this space. By so, the sound inside so, the silos also, right? So, yeah. And, and so for the last seven or eight years, she's given me um, the ability to play in and with these silos. And that play has really taken on two forms. One is to turn the building itself into a musical instrument that plays itself. It's a requiem for water. It's a um, constant sound that permeates both the environment of the silo and the dry lake bed. But anyone driving through that turns on 89.9 FM. We have a bootlegged radio station and here's it as well. And it's also on the radio, on the internet radio. So what's the radio channel? KPPG Live. Dot org. KPPG is P -P Pittsburgh. PPG, Pittsburgh Glass, and K because all radio stations. Yeah, right. And so if you go to KPPG Live, yeah. you can listen. Anywhere you are. What in the we world. were just listening to when you walked in was the Owens Valley. In fact, let's. Can oh, we yeah. turn it? Rebecca, can you, if you see us back there, can you try to give us a little bit of that of that music? Not not the. We'll video. also have it in the camera yeah, we'll today, the, so you'll be but, able to but hear just it. Just listen again to a little bit of this. And when you say you turned it into an Aeolian harp, what did you do? How did you? We uh, the the Pittsburgh plate glass, which you'll see in the video that will shortly run about our work. So what you're hearing now are a series of pan flutes that go from one silo to another across a catwalk that yeah. spans um, probably a couple of hundred feet. And the silos are 100 feet by 30 feet. And the, they're strung with steel cables from the top to the bottom. So the wind that moves through them makes sound. And when it's quite windy, you also get these flute-type sounds. Um, and there's a couple of other surprises I won't And reveal. if you bookmark this on your, on your uh, computer at home, you'll find yourself listening to it all the time. Yeah, it's, 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 it's exquisite. Yeah. And when it's a jet never goes by overhead, you can hear the jet. What, what you feel there's like. owls that live in there. And uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And it's also, it's also kind of nice to know that wherever you are, whenever you are, there's a siren singing to you. <laughs> and it's, uh, and, and that, that, that leads us into this mythological aspect of this work, which is to be able to make artwork which somehow transcends human time um, is something which uh, is, is a complex uh, thing to do. And so when you're working on a glacial time requiem, um, you're, you're trying to make something that doesn't require any other intervention, not electricity, um, you know, it just requires that the building doesn't fall down, which it eventually will, or it will meet some other limitation. Which will sound great. That'll, when sound, it good. That'll, That'll sound, sound so good. good. That'll be really great. <laughs> um, by the way, you know that we have the four minute video, so you can yeah. decide when you want to show that. Or Yeah, uh, I thought we would show you, so I've described the sonic division. The optics division actually came a little bit later because once I started to work on the sound, I realized this um, issue of if you're making a sound, who's it for? You know, uh, and what is the sound? What is the sound of regeneration, and why would we hear it at all? 
So to communicate some of these concepts, I thought about filmmaking and I thought about the relationship between film and sound, how they're, they've always been in such an interesting relationship where they are sometimes absolutely wed to one another, but originally they were two different aspects of the same production. So, so there was the, the sonic and the optical. Of, of any film production. Right. And, and so I began my work in film with a three-day shootout, um, pun intended. Um, um, we, we put together every aspect of a film from making our own cameras to shooting, uh, shooting with them and developing them at night. Um, we brought a Berlin-based Sam Beckett director to do a community chorus as a score in one of the silos, uh, a section from Crap's Last Tape. Um, and um, Tristan showed up at that workshop, um, and uh, we have been working together um, since then. Um, Rich, who is um, um, my partner in life, <laughs> has been um, part of this journey since we started um, yeah. Being together and is our, our first, uh, uh, my first experience with the Owens Valley actually was a picnic. Lauren said, "Oh, we're going to go up to this lake for a picnic," <laughs> and we go and sit beside this empty lake. And Lauren, and, and have it was picnic. love at first sight. Love at first sight. <laughs> but this was, you know, this was seven years ago, and Lauren described healing this area, healing this lake with sound. And she pointed across the lake to this abandoned factory and said this would be the first object that would create the sound that would heal the lake. And we're now doing it. And um, my entry into this scene, I, I had heard that these people, I, I didn't know Lauren and Rich at this time, but I, I had heard, I was living in Boulder, Colorado at this time, and I had heard that these people were going to be trying to make a film out of the landscape. So literally um, developing the film out of this chemical soup of the uh, Owens lake bed. So you literally, that, on the shootout, you made your own cameras out of boxes with a pinhole. Mm -hmm. Film cameras, film. actually, uh, yeah, Super 8. They so were... you have Super 8 film with a little box with a pinhole, yeah. but then you have to develop it, and that's... Yeah, and, and so this, you know, I, I came out um, not knowing at all what I was getting into, um, and we proceeded over Journeys. the next three days um, <laughs> to uh, make a film. And, and we developed, we succeeded in developing the film with the help of a man named Robert Shaler from the Handmade Film Institute, also near Boulder, Colorado. Um, we, we were able to develop the film using the Trona uh, ash that Pittsburgh plate glass had been mining for glass production. So, um, so there's just piles of this ash and you took the film mm -hmm. undeveloped film and you developed it with that yeah, yeah. Yes. So but you, also you the pictures the, of the piles that were developed in the piles the yeah. slurry from the from the the rehydration project that i had alluded to when the u.s government said you had to do something to keep the dust down los angeles uh, was being sued by the federal government because of Lead the a little bit problems. closer to that so people, yeah. Los Angeles was being sued. Being sued because of the, this dust problem that was uh, occurring because the lake had dried up so, in an unusually quick amount of time. I mean, so we found some d immersive developing ponds as a, uh, as a fringe benefit of Los Angeles's rehydration. We would go in at night because um, the dry lake bed is held in trust for the people of the state of California as a water body. And we realize that water bodies have, by law, right to public access. So we realized that we had a right. Not only did we have a right, we were being encouraged to exercise that right to go and enjoy recreate on the Owens dry lake bed. We found that we were one of a very small group of people who would recreate 
on the Owens Dry Lake bed the by carcinogenic dust is, by, is a little bit of a you know deterrent everybody to finds their there's all thing. kinds of creativity so, involved yeah. here yes right <laughs> so so that's the beginning of our story but, and but why so don't, you're saying that that you could use that to develop film as if yes you, so you don't have to go to the to the so what hour developer yes you, you too to can come recreate with us on yep. the carcinogenic Owen Dry Lake bed so, and to develop your own films so the same situation that we were describing before of this glacial lake that it, it was an evaporative lake so over millennia there was no outlet for the water except to evaporate out so all of this mineral content was deposited um, and left and when Los Angeles drained um, most of the remaining water um, it, it greatly accelerated that kind of um, well, and also because they're continuously adding water now to maintain the dust. It's a really weird it's situation. It's a complicated out titration, there. and we know you understand that very well here yeah. in Chicago. Right. <laughs> so you know this is not a unique uh, a unique problem. Um, most of the world is now importing their water from someplace so, far away. And so we've re-engineered most of our water sources. So you know, we do have this film. Do you want to show? Yeah, it? yeah or do you want to explain about the silo and the? I think that this would be a good time to introduce. We made a small. Uh, film that it's two or three minutes and it kind of will give you you've you've been introduced to the location of our engagement and the basic themes of it this will explain a little bit more i think about the process do you unless there's anything else you want well, this this just kind of is a a, a brief thing in, in introducing the liminal camera as a tool so um the liminal camera emerged partly out of these experiments. Um, we, we were dealing with this veritable periodic table of elements, essentially. And we started, and the, the term that we came actually on that first three days together, we started talking about this pursuit of what we called the indexical image. And to us, what that term means is um, to pursue a photograph that's literally an imprint of the landscape, a, a photograph of the landscape made entirely out of the landscape. So mining the silver, for example, from the Sierras, finding the chemical components to make our own developer, um, working with Sourcing the gelatin from the cattle. Yeah. And, 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 and what you're photographing is that landscape. Yeah. Yeah. So that what we end up with is this, this photograph that has the, the, is imbued with the material essence of its subject. So the liminal camera partly came out of that pursuit. Um, we needed something also, when you're working on that scale, when you're thinking about uh, photography as a land-based practice, as a, as a land earthwork, um, we needed a camera big enough. The earth doing a selfie. Yeah. yeah. So we needed some kind of view big enough to... Well, with, Lauren, that with project. Lauren's projects, with the projects that we've been involved with before this, there is a there's a scale to them, and we really needed a tool to record that scale. Kind of the big picture, the so big to speak. picture, absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing that um, it connects to is this particular notion in contemporary art of the void. So, if you think about the Owens Dry Lake Bed as a void or a negative of the city of Los Angeles, then the empty shipping container is also the void of the global market. So if there's one standard unit of trade internationally, it's the shipping container. Which is the, the body is, of the liminal camera. Yeah. Is a so my so memory I of wanted, this, by the way, I, is this the film, but, but one of the things you did is you put a pinhole in the silo. Yeah. Yes. Starters. So imagine you've got the silo that's making all that fantastic music. If you just put, drill a hole in it, you will get on the other side of the hole an upside down version of what's happening in the front of it. Yeah, and we, invite, we invited the lake into one of the silos. So, and then you, so and I then think you had this, paper. this is a good time perhaps to, to run show, the show, film because I think you have all of the yeah, parts of and then we can go on. Okay, from. So let's run that little film. A liminal camera, a dark place with a single opening to let light in, a liminal place, a place in transition, one world gone, 
a world of interlocking glacial lakes, moving fresh water from the high Sierras to the ocean. Another yet to be born. A world where the scars of the dry lake bed created by the exportation of water is again redefined by water returning to the Owens Valley. The shipping container itself, a standard size for global trade. The adventure, the quest, is to make a single image out of the landscape that's been ruined by the creation of the city of Los Angeles. A single image in a digital age shot through an empty container with a single hole to let light in, developed right there by a dry lake bed with chemistry scavenged from the materials left behind. A single image, a portrait of a practice. Let's do this slowly now. You've got a... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> a container, and those are just a standard container that, that is, yep. by the way, and, and you have no idea how, how capitalism has been completely transformed by those containers. Yeah. You used to think of longshoremen, you know, the real workers, and you know, now it's just put yeah. in boxes. All that's been... The just, intermodal container. Yeah. And so you've got one of those, and you put it on the back of a truck, and, and you've just put a hole in it. Yep. Yep. And what do you see on the other side? First we saw, first we, well, originally what we were building was a, actually a, um, a mobile kitchen that was going to be used up in Owens Valley for a different project that Lauren had been working on. And Tristan and I were standing in the uh, container. I wanted to see how thick the wall was. Yeah, and uh, we realized that, that it, it made this immediately light. It's a ready-made darkroom, yeah. in, a, in essence, because the same reasons that... Um, that a, a container needs to be watertight also just inadvertently make it a perfect light tight box. And we drilled a hole in it to see sort of how thick the material was and we we're standing scratching our heads. You immediately see an image. Yeah, just, and the image over our shoulder was of a car. Yeah. And we were like, oh my God, there's a car. Up, upside down. Upside down. And then, and then we clicked from builders to photographers and realized the, you know, the idea of the, of the pinhole camera and you know, all of our uh, photography training came back. And we moved it outside and brought Lauren in, and we were mesmerized by this image. It's the most glorious thing to see. You are not the first to have been mesmerized. No. All through the Renaissance, yeah. All, yeah. It, people seeing that image is the most amazing thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's movies, basically. It's, and it's it, also it, the key to philosophy. I mean, sure. when Plato writes about the cave, uh, it's also this, also this metaphoric dark space where light enters that void. So, yeah. you know, we had discovered the beauty of being on the inside of a camera is that you, you become this mythic philosopher. Everybody who walks in is a philosopher instantly. And by the way, we are all on the inside of our cameras, if we would only, and what this allows us to do is to realize how we're this way all the time, yeah. if we think about it. But so you're looking at that. Tell the story about the flag. That, the, the, that's really great. So we, the very first shoot that we did with the liminal camera was just outside of the silo in the center of the dry lake bed. And the center of the light, you have to imagine that the dry lake bed is 100 miles, right? So it's a massive area, and it's got engineered roadways um, on it for the rehydration projects that always fail and are incredibly costly. And um, one of my challenges as an artist has been to not participate in the um, slamming of the Los Angeles water authorities, um, who uh, the LADWP I think has been voted one of the top most hated organizations in the whole United States. LA Department of Water and Power. Yeah, but you have to imagine that in the 50s and 60s in Los Angeles, they were one of the most popular they were the uh, heroes. They were the heroes they of a city. Cheap water to LA. Five cents a gallon or something like. I mean, it was. They were. They did a really, really good job at what they had been mandated to do. 
So I had proposed to the LADWP that as an act of American exceptionalism, we hoist a giant American flag in the middle of this 100-mile dry lake bed. Um, and they agreed to that. So that's amazing in and of itself, but it's also amazing because there are ghastly winds up there, and hoisting a giant American flag is not a good idea. So, but what the heck? Um, who, who could knew? get hurt? There's nobody but us out there. So, well, we, did, uh, we had veterans groups with us out there too. So there was, yeah, a, there oh, was the, some jeopardy. The to veterans others. loved it. I, I, the studio works a lot with uh, homeless veterans in Los Angeles, and we had a few who loved this challenge of climbing and hoisting the American flag and gale force this wind. This was a giant flag too. Hundred, this was a fl hundred feet? Hundred foot yeah. flag. How big is it compared to this room? It would fill this whole room. Oh, we, yeah, it would twice. fill the whole room. And we, we carried it around the country yeah. with us on our for, first tour. Um, but we, we hoisted it in front of the White House. Uh, we hoisted it everywhere because we, we partly wanted people to come inside the camera. And when they did, what they saw was the American flag in distress which is the upside down American so, so flag. If, you, if you're on a boat that is in trouble, you put the flag upside down, and that means we are in distress. Yeah. So your first picture was a picture of incredibly distressed terrain with, with an upside down American flag. Well, the f in, the, in the picture, picture, it's right side up. But oh, inside the camera, the camera, it's reversed. Right, yeah, right. So, so in that, reality, it's... it's it's the camera. The camera takes the image and reverses it upside down. So and tells the truth. Yeah, it and so truth. it it creates this interesting um, state of uncertainty. But the difference between inside and outside is vast in terms of image making. And so our name for this camera as liminal refers to as Rilke, to use another Rilke quote, one world gone, another yet to be born. Thre liminal means threshold. threshold. The limon is the, is the rock at the top of you know, that. That's the limit, and you walk through it, you've walked through the M threshold. Most people are probably familiar with, with the term liminal in the context of subliminal, which is beneath the, the threshold of consciousness. And that's, that's another aspect that we work with a lot with the liminal camera is bringing awareness, bringing consciousness to these forgotten spaces like the Owens Valley, for example. So, so uh, we're going to, in a second, in about five minutes, we're going to come to you guys, so have questions ready. But, but one thing I want to do is talk about the little, putting that on a, what it means to put that on a flatbed truck and take it around, and then what specifically you're doing here in Chicago with it. So talk, talk to us about that. Well, putting it onto the flatbed was sort of a no-brainer. Once we realized that we had a camera, Tristan and I spent yeah, We a, could a, only take so many shots of, of that the car, thing, that yeah. one car that was <laughs> parked right outside. <laughs> so we, we, you know, and these things are designed to be put on we, the back. We of are trucks. entertained really easily, so yeah. we, we were satisfied with that years, image, but... actually, for a lot longer than we cared to admit. Should, we also decided been. to make it super hot inside, too, so we, we, we would spend hours inside about a 110-degree uh, metal <laughs> container yes. with chemistry. It was like a kind of medieval torture box yeah. actually yeah. in the beginning. So. By the time it, it made it to the like lake bed. It's kind of like ice fishing. You know how men folk like to go out in the middle of nowhere and, and sit and hope for fish? Well, these guys would be in the limo camera hoping sweating, for, hoping, hoping for someone shots. would drive by, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, we quite quickly realized that in order for this thing to work, and we were real, as a, as a team, we're very performative. We, we do a lot of things in public. We like to work with the public. We invite them to participate in most of our projects. And this camera is designed to be performative as well as taking photos. And it's also really designed to bear witness. Yeah. So th something happened that really galvanized us to put the ca camera on a truck and, and move, and, and that was the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Yeah. Um, that date was coming up, and um, I often talk about the metabolic cycle of work as having its genesis in 9-11, because it became very clear to me as a... Uh, you know, mother with two young kids living on top of a mountain that I better figure out what to do if the worst 
happened. And what the worst meant for me was I couldn't use my credit card at the supermarket. Like, what am I going to do? Um, but this idea of becoming self-sufficient and understanding what it meant to rely on community and to understand uh, what and how survival would work sort of has driven the metabolic cycle. And so when the 10th anniversary of 9-11 came up, we decided to drive the camera to New York and take a commemorative medal using silver as a medal to um, take a picture of Manhattan's skyline on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And we were given permission to be on Governor's Island um, on the morning and took our first mobile picture. And once we were on wheels, we decided to hoist that. We brought the American flag with us, the giant one, and we hoisted it in three specific locations that we felt were um, key to understanding the, um, the notion of American exceptionalism and its limitations. One was uh, Washington, D.C. on the mall. We were there for Veterans Day the se two months later. No, one 11, month. 11, 11, 11. 11, 11, 11. Um, we did a shot and a performance where we hoisted the giant American flag, invited people again into the camera, and we did our first uh, overlay of a historical image, um, which was the Bonus Army Rebellion, or the last time in American history that soldiers camped out in front of the White House for bonuses promised them during that the were depression. Not, during the Depression. And thirdly, we went to witness the closing of Kodak. We were there on the, on the day that Kodak declared bankruptcy in Rochester and took that photo. Um, and we discovered that one thing having a giant camera on wheels allows you to do is not get permits. Yeah. <laughs> so we would drive up. It's the principle of hidden in plain sight. So uh, the, the sheer scale of this thing, people, it's amazing what you can do if you wear a reflective vest and you're driving a big, a truck. big truck. People, you know, we can pull over we in the middle of the We assume anyway. nobody from yeah. Al Qaeda is here in the room. <laughs> But. Yeah, well, yeah, we did We did think we were the most unlikely terrorists in the world, <laughs> you right. know, if surreptitious. With it, that said, we've also been boarded by pretty much every uh, authority in the United <laughs> including States. Including New York Harbor on 9-11, yeah. yeah. the Coast Guard came after us. But it's just so fantastic when you get inside that oh, everybody yeah. loves you. Uh, I do want to get the, you into Chicago here because we're going to ask, so what are you doing here in Chicago? Well, Gelatin. We, well, uh, I mean, part of um, what we initially wanted to photograph here is continuing this story of photography as this industrial medium that we're seeing the demise of. So we were in, as Lauren mentioned, we were in Rochester to document the bankruptcy of Kodak Corporation. And um, this, this narrative that Lauren mentioned in the beginning of um, realizing that uh, photography, the materials for photography were literally mined in the West. So the silver coming from the mountains and the Sierras going back to make film. But then film, the, the medium of film, finding its greatest subject in the great American West. So photographs, photographers brought those silver films back out to the West, documented them, and then sent silver images back to the East in the form of broadsides and postcards advertising this paradise of the West. So it's a really interesting conversation. And um, Chicago is a part of that, uh, that in industry because of the um, Union stockyards and the gelatin that was coming out of Chicago was the flesh, the meat of uh, that. Slow down on that. So, how, how is the, what is gelatin? So gelatin is, uh, it's the collagen, it's the, it's the actual um, the emulsion. It's it, it's the it's from the bones and skin bones of and cows skins. and pigs, and it forms the the material that uh, the silver is suspended inside of. So any time you hold a real black and white photograph, not a digital print, you're holding a piece of gelatin of cow flesh with little particles of silver suspended in it. So that's which that's have been the developed material. by the same materials that are uh, that exist now in the Owens Black. So you are here in Chicago, and just... Uh, this is the most fabulous photo, uh, city to take photographs of. Let's We're, hear it for Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you say that? 
it, it, you know, it's so photogenic with 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 this the story of uh, architecture in the city. Um, we're obviously blessed with some remarkable weather right now, uh, but it's it's. It's accessible, it's friendly, everyone that we talk to, we're given free access to wherever we need to be. And what are you gonna do with those photos? Um, we are gonna be having a, an exhibition actually coming up in May at the DePaul Art Museum. So so keep keep checking back for that. So actually, we will have a developing session. We're, we're gonna be opening the camera to the public at many of the Chicago Humanities events. Including and today. Then Including um, when we're finished here, you, you can all walk over. We're going we're gonna to do a journey yep. over to the Khan Auditorium, which is where the liminal camera is right now, and they'll let you in. You'll let people in, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. You can come inside and, and see the And you would be crazy image. not to do this. It's come a long way. It's come 2,000 miles just for you. So, But um, also on Wednesday, we will be doing a developing session, Wednesday evening, at the DePaul Art Museum, where you can come inside and not just see the camera and the image, but actually see how we develop an image. And you'll get a preview. With dirt. We yeah. develop on the inside <laughs> of the camera. Um, so the camera is both an optical tool and a developing tool. And we'll be using lake water. Yeah. And we're sourcing our chemistry. We'll be for, using Lake Michigan water yeah, for our so. developing, um, just to keep it local. <laughs> and uh, that actually brings up Basically, another. Basically, locavore photography is yeah, what you yeah, guys yeah, are doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'd also well, like to say another thing that we're very interested in is because of the larger narrative of the studio working with water, um, we, we're really interested in examining different cities' relationship to water. And Chicago actually is a very interesting case study of a, of a, of a um, city that exists because of water. So in, in, in a way, it's the opposite of Los Angeles. Los Angeles exists in spite of lack. Chicago exists because of the next, the intersection of the port and the access to the Mississippi through the Chicago River and the canals that were built. So we've been looking at a lot of the history of uh, the Chicago River and the sanitation issues that had to be resolved here. So th that's kind of the meat of our investigation. And, and I should also say that the studio is opening a branch of an inquiry into the Great Lakes. So we just are opening an office in Detroit. Um, we were there for the UN uh, raconteurs last week um, who were there to look into the water shutoffs going on. Talk there. about it. Not everybody knows about that. Tell about what that is. Um, about the water shutoff, what's happening in Detroit. Uh, Detroit, as you all know, is uh, bankrupt and uh, vastly overbuilt um, for the current size that it's in. and the infrastructure for water in need of repair and in the hopes of looking for private, uh, you know, privatizing the water supply, they've been trying to lose their debt. So when people can't pay their water bills, they shut their water off. And so um, the UN um, uh, encouraged to take a look at this by activists internationally who have been horrified by the hundreds of thousands of people who are being displaced by water shutoffs, not just because they're urban poor, but because communities like that are not easy to replace. So these are really entrenched, wonderfully rich uh, communities of human beings that can't support each other because they shut up whole neighborhoods. And so I went uh, with some of the studio team to bear witness, which is part of what we do with the camera, um, but we also do with our practice, is bear witness to um, American civic action and progress, to be participants in the civic practice. Sometimes the best thing you can do, like you are today, is be an audience. No talk is better than the audience you get to talk to. So thank you for coming out to listen to us. I went with a couple of other people on the team to listen to people give their stories to the UN last uh, Saturday. And the next day, the UN made a statement against the United States saying it was an abridgment of the UN's right. The UN has a right to water, which means you can't shut people's water supply off even if they can't pay their bills. Of course, that doesn't mean policy shifts, it just means there becomes a, an ethical idea that is acknowledged by the UN that gets put out there. So in connection to our work in the Intermountain West, um, we um, 
are are looking into the Great Lakes because 80% of the fresh water in the North American continent is here, and there's plenty of residual problems that are the inheritance of you know the industrial era in the Great Lakes, and so we are uh, now working into having a bigger presence in the Great Lakes, so you might see us around Chicago. This might be the beginning of um, a longer relationship. I hope so. Chicago is a incredible, incredible city to be in. It's just my fourth day here, and I feel like a starstruck kid at Christmas. I mean, <laughs> it's magnificent. I have a degree in architecture, so... <laughs> I cannot believe that it's taken me this long to um, really savor being here. Um, and also, it really has its own unique quality of gentility about it that isn't like any place else I think I've ever been. So very happy to be here. And we're hoping to also use our time here this week to hear from you about places that you know of that relate to the story of water or industrialization or civic pride in water. We've noticed water towers are also a very particular thing in the Midwest because you don't have gravity feed as easily available to you here as we do. And that's an entirely gravity-fed system that allowed Los Angeles to get water from 240 miles away. So we hope that you'll share your stories with us. While, we were, we were, we're going to have questions, but we don't have time for that. But instead, what we have is that we are all of us going to walk over to Kanye, and you can grab them. Here they are. This is what they look like. <laughs> and as we're walking over, you can grab them. And then, for that matter, you can drag them into the liminal camera with you and continue your conversation, and we'll do that together. Yeah. So, uh, Karina, how are we going to go there? What's, are you going to be sending us, sh helping people know where we're going? Look at that person over there. She'll be, she, she's Pied Karina there. Autumnal girl. Thank you so much. That was. Thank you.